Hey guys, welcome back. You join me not from the workshop, but possibly from the year 1994, which is a bit weird because neither I nor YouTube exist, but I have managed to pick up my new boom box from the store, and boy oh boy, does it smell like music to my taste buds. And I picked up a bunch of D-cell batteries, so this should give me at least five hours of playback. Unfortunately, the second I popped in my tape, it had other ideas other than playing out of the blue. Now thankfully, because this is mostly a purely mechanical product, I've been able to tear it down and find out what's gone wrong. And as it turns out, the issue is the rubber belts which drive the take-up reel have aged out and they've turned to a black sludge. Which is a bit strange because this is supposedly brand new and you'd only expect that to happen after a good, I don't know, 30 years or so. Now I spent the past half hour trying to clean it out and by the looks of things, I've gotten most of the way. But really, that's neither here nor there, because what I'm really interested in talking about is the drive assembly for the AM-FM tuner. Honestly, I spent way too much time looking at this just because it's so cool. I love how analog it all is, and I love how the tuner knob is connected to a gear train, which moves a rack, which in turn moves the display. I mean, you never think about how these things work until you actually have to tear it down, and when you do, you're just amazed at how much design and effort went into actually, well, designing it and making it work. And as well as doing that, it also adjusts the tuner itself. I know this is obviously me just showing my age because all the electronic stuff I've soldered is all just done via integrated circuits, but I just love this old analog manual stuff. But what really caught my attention are these two gears that are at right angles to each other. As you'd probably know, I'm slowly working my way through machining different types of gears, and whilst on the surface, it's not exactly the most thrilling topic, once you start to look into the subject, you'll quickly realise that without some type of universal milling machine, and a universal dividing head to go with it, it's actually quite difficult to make things outside of your normal spur gears and worm gears. And if I'm completely honest, the worm gear that I made wasn't the easiest to cut without a proper universal hob. I had to resort to an older free hobbing method, but I guess you can't argue with the results. Now the thing is, for what I've done so far, normal gear trains that are on the same plane have been good enough. But in the background, I have been looking at ways for transmitting force into another axis. And by that, I mostly mean, well, 90 degrees. You know, I guess in some ways, a worm gearbox does do that. I mean, it sends the output force 90 degrees to the input, but that is at the cost of a lot of frictional loss through the gearbox and a huge loss in speed. For a worm drive, the drop in speed is proportional to the number of teeth in the gear, so a 40 tooth gear, like I have here, means you're going to get a 40 to 1 drop in speed. So essentially it takes 40 turns of the worm screw to drive the gear once. And the thing is with worm drives is you can't back drive them very easily. So the worm is always going to be your input and the gear is always going to be your output. So effectively this means that it's always going to be a speed reduction gearbox. Now obviously this is good if you want that speed drop, but if you don't, a worm drive isn't going to cut it. And from memory, the lowest reduction that you can go with these gearboxes is 12 or 13. So effectively, a 1 to 12 reduction, which in many regards is a lot. Now at this point, you're probably wondering about bevel and miter gears, which is the normal way to transmit power at an angle. And I've been working on this on and off for a while, but the fact is, bevel gears are actually quite difficult to make with normal equipment, because the teeth aren't straight. They're angled, or I guess tapered inwards, and they do change size, and that's just because they converge towards the center. So the teeth need to shrink the closer they get towards the middle. It's not simply a process of cutting the teeth at an angle, it's a lot more complicated than that. And as a result, to make them on a normal dividing head, you need special, rare, and expensive cutters. Well, I guess more expensive and more special than the cutters that I already own. Needless to say, I don't have any yet. However, by the time I got around to editing the video, as it turns out, they're currently on sale. I don't know about you, but this seems to be a lot easier than trying to figure out how to make the cutters from scratch. So I might be buying these in the near future, although they're still pretty expensive. So when I saw this gear arrangement in the boom box, I was pretty intrigued, because it looks to be some type of face gear, which is actually a type of gear that I know the least about. Most of my textbooks seem to skip over it, and the information that is there seems to be quite limited. Now just looking at it, it really just looks like a cylinder with the gear teeth cut into the side with no inwards taper. 
And if it is there, it seems to be pretty minimal. And that's probably down to the fact that the teeth are quite thin. Now after looking a bit further, I did find one document that covers something called a straight cut face gear, which I'm going to try and replicate here in the workshop. Now from what I can gather, these types of gears should be good for positioning and low power transmission, and they should be able to be made with normal gear cutters. Let's get started and see if it works. Now I do want to be clear that this is more of an off the cuff video, so unfortunately I didn't have any steel large enough to make a face gear, so what I'm going to be using here is a 42mm piece of acetal, which would be okay since a lot of gears are made from either nylon or acetal, and they work just fine. So the first thing I'll do is I'll face down the stock and then I'll drill and then ream out the centre. I can then take down the outside to its final dimension. I'm going for 50 teeth and it's a 0.8 module. So to calculate that I have the engineer's black book on hand and if we go to the page about gear cutting, as you can see I have the website loaded up and I've already plugged in the numbers. Which as it turns out is 41.6 millimeters. Next I need to work out how wide the teeth need to be. Now because we're going to be using the conventional spur gear cutters to cut this, we're obviously not going to see any taper in the teeth. And as a result, we're probably going to see some very uneven contact between the gear teeth, since the face gear is going to be moving in sort of an arced fashion. Now according to the method that I'm following, it tries to minimise this being a big issue by keeping the teeth as thin as possible, and keeping it to roughly two times the module. And that is the gear blank now done. Now it's also recommended in this method to use the neck sized up cutter to give the tooth a bit more clearance. If you're not familiar with these types of cutters, the shape of the tooth does get larger the fewer the number of teeth that it needs to cut. And by doing this it should give the teeth a bit more room to move around in and hopefully prevent any binding. Now I'll probably lose some efficiency in doing this, but for this setup I'm more focused on it working and making sure that it doesn't bind up. So nothing left to do but get the gear teeth cut. I'll now make the pinion gear with about half the number of teeth.
With the gears now made and parted off, I'll now need to make up a quick testing frame. And I'm going to be making it from some wood. You know, these are small gears, so wood should be perfectly fine. And here's something that I learnt, you can ream wood and the fit is going to be way better than you'd expect. Alright, let's see if it works. And you know what? That works way better than I was expecting. You know, I was expecting it to be tight in some spots, but it works surprisingly well. And even under power, I thought it was going to rip itself apart once I used the battery drill, but it's working really well. I do think using the next sized up gear cutter was something that has helped it quite a lot, and I think I could even go two sizes up in the future. All in all, I'm really happy that this has worked because it just gives me options for when I'm designing stuff in the future. Now, strictly speaking, I do want to point out that I don't think this is a true face gear. I think in your proper face gears, it is going to have some sort of taper to them. But I think this is the best approximation that we can make with basic gear cutters. And really for positioning work and for low amounts of power, this should be more than enough. And once this is made in steel or aluminium, this should be just fine. So yeah, I'm really chuffed about that. And until I properly work out how to make a bevel gear cutter, this is going to be my go-to in the future. And that's about it for now. I hope you enjoy these off-the-cuff videos because they are really a big learning exercise for me and I find them incredibly useful. And in turn, I hope you find them useful too. And with that, see you next week.